we'll go ahead and start. Okay. Um, well, thank you everybody for coming out here to Thomas Crane Public Library for our program tonight. Um, before we get started, I want to thank the friends of the Thomas Crane Public Library. Their support allows us to do a lot of interesting programs like this one tonight and also on Sunday at 3 o'clock in the Richardson Building, we're going to have musician Kylie Carey, who is a Gaelic Americana musician, and she's going to put on a concert for an hour in the Richardson Building. So we'd love for everybody to show up for that as well. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce our uh, hosts here for the night. We have Jordan Rich and Diane Godfrey. Hi, everybody. Look at that. We want to thank you for coming out, and we are, there's no issue, we, we will do a show for two people, one person, a small person, a child with a mask, <laughs> it doesn't matter, and we're also streaming. Welcome. Um, my name is Jordan Rich. Many of you may have heard of me from radio. I've been around for a million years, and uh, I'm also a podcaster, uh, very active in the podcast realm. So before we start in with Diane's amazing work and stories about this true crime podcast adventure, a little bit of background on the podcast adventure that she got herself into. Uh, how many of you uh, in the room are podcast aficionados who listen to podcasts regularly? Oh, okay. Occasionally. Occasionally. Okay. We're going to convert you. Well, you don't listen to a ton. You're just being shy. Podcasts are growing at an incredible rate and it's all cool to me because it's audio, just like radio on demand for any pickles I see on your shirt. There's probably 50 podcasts about pickles. So point being, Diane is, is a rising star in the podcast field. So here's how it happened and I'll turn it over to you. I'll make you blush. No, you could, you could well, continue. Well, I like to set it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So Diane took a, a, took a, we taught a class, my partner and I, on Zoom for Boston Casting Company on the creation of podcasts, whether people wanted to get into it. We had like 18 people and it was a two- It was in the worst part of the pandemic. It was at the, the yeah. bottom end. When no one was going out. Or so all, all the people who joined had all these great ideas, blah, 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 blah. There's only one person who followed through and that's this lady. She was asking more questions. And when we found out what she did and what her intention was, we said, go for it. Turns out, she did go for it with my help, and we've been sort of partnering on this podcast. I'm the Ed McMahon to her, Johnny Carson. I can only say that to certain groups who are old enough to understand. So my role in the podcast is to not only physically produce it, but to assist as sort of an on-site announcer and so forth. But Diane does the lion's share. So it's called All Rise with Diane Godfrey. And before we start, it is a true crime podcast. And if you look at the statistics on podcasts, true crime is, if not the top, very close to the top genre that people are interested in. And I don't know about you, but I'm fascinated by these documentaries on TV and YouTube about serial killers and all this weird stuff. I mean, it's the, it's the stuff that we don't ever want to do ourselves, but we want to read about it and learn about it. Okay, enough said. Diane, you're having a lot of fun. We, uh, by the way, we just produced our 26th episode. And we're going to talk about episodes tonight. But talk about your experience, why the, you are the right person for this particular gig because of the, the work you've done for 30 plus years. Well, I kind of, when I was younger, I had fits and starts of different things. I will admit I was extremely immature. You know, I went to college and I dropped out and I was down the beach all the time having a blast, and I just didn't know where to go or what to do, but my brother had a girlfriend that one day brought in a steno machine into our home, and she opened it up, you know, you carried it like a suitcase, you know, we're all gawking at it, like, wow, and it intrigued me, but oddly enough, around that time, my father came in the house and he said, I saw something today in court, of all things, and he said, I think you'd be good at it, so I'm like, what? And he said, a court stenographer. So I was like, okay, you know, I just, you know, when your father says something, you're just like. So anyway, I ended up, make a long story short, I went to Mass Bay in Framingham where they had a tremendous program, which with budget cuts, it's long gone. The state nixed it. But um, I went to there, and then I had an internship at Norfolk Superior Court in Dedham. And from there, I finally, I waited a long time, but the state finally hired me. 
and I worked at, in Superior Court as a stenographer, five days a week in a courtroom underneath the judge's nose, as a silent scribe. Just whatever I heard went, you know, I recorded and that was it. And a lot of people don't understand that I don't transcribe anything until somebody, there's a need for it. Because some court proceedings, at the end of the proceeding, everyone's happy and everyone walks away and you don't need a transcript. So some things never get transcribed. But I've done in the last few years many, many murder cases and they always get trans, unless they're not guilty. So. Well, let's just, uh, for these kind folks here, just chat about what really goes on in the courtroom. And first of all, mechanically, how does it work now as opposed to the old days when you first started? What's different? Well, um, technology naturally has catapulted forward. And it's funny, when you worked for the, st work as for the state, I no longer work for them. It's odd. It's like the craziest... I don't expect people to understand, but I was a state worker, and 30 years into it, they decided they were going to replace all court stenographers with a machine. So they paid a ton of money, and they put this recording, fancy recording device in every courtroom, and I mean every courtroom, bankruptcy court, juvenile court, probate court, superior court, district court. And while it has some good qualities, it's not sufficient in my opinion and in a lot of other people's opinion because they still hire me for life felony cases. So I predominantly do, 99% of my work now are murders. I did five this past fall and I, starting next Tuesday, I have nine of them in a row through July. Boy, that's, so, a, that's, a that's optimistic. Too many, yeah. it's, too many murders. it's a lot of murders. Now do you have to wait a certain amount of time in order to, are you, are, what's, the, you know, what's the reality of that? Well, that's a good question. Um, now, after a trial, when, when a trial is in motion, you can't say a word. But after it's, you know, the verdict comes down and the, and the sentencing takes place, you technically, anyone can talk about it then, but I don't. I, when I speak about things with Jordan or with you guys, I do stuff that's ancient. In other words, it's been, you know, decided by a jury. It made its way through the appellate court. The people have long since been in jail. And I don't, because my, I would never want to, when things are too fresh, I mean, there were many people involved, like families, and I'm sensitive to, I don't want to bum anyone out or hurt anybody or, uh, that's not my purpose. But people have an insatiable, they, like, they'll come up to me. Like, even at Christmas time, my brother's girlfriend came to the door. Instead of, like, saying, you know, what are we going to have to eat? She's like, tell me about the court. I mean, they all want to know. Yeah. Do, you, do you go through the proper channels? Like, uh, do you file FOIAs for them, or do you just use the copies that you have on your own? What do, what do you mean? Do you still have, do you, like, do you, do you, uh, I had a lot of trouble filing FOIA requests for, for records that are kept for third party court reporters. I don't what? I'm just, I'm just curious, like, do you, do you just go back, like, oh yeah, I worked on this, I worked on this case 10 years ago, I'm going to go and get all the records for it? Well, I keep, the, it's, keep, well, this is how it is. When you have a murder trial, any of my notes or any of my recordings, forever and ever and ever, that you can never oh, yeah. destroy them, oh, ever. Really? And they will stay in a vault Personal in the, like no, in the court. I'll put them in a vault. I have two different vaults at Suffolk County. They're two different vaults, and I know where my stuff is. And um, if I were to like drop dead, they'd, like they made us fill out a thing, and I put what years or where. So some there's a, there's a trail of it in the administrative office. They they can find it, and um, some people kept better. We're not going to name names, but <laughs> some people in the administrative offices are like, oh my god, like people weren't. Some court reporters weren't as oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, uh, that's a very interesting question, and, and uh, as we go along, because we're a small group, feel free to interrupt us with any questions. But that's an interesting question that's not been asked at one of these public. I think forums it's insightful. It's great because there's so many thousands of hours of transcript and so forth. It's just mind blowing. I want to though, and we're going to be talking about specific podcast topics. So you'll get a sense of what it is we do and what Diane does. And she is, I can say this without question, 
so careful about making sure everything we say is correct and just and, and quantified. But we always like to talk about courtrooms and what really goes on in the courtroom. So let's do that. For some of you, you may be very familiar, but for the audience at home, is it at all like it is on Law and Order? We get that question all the time. Yes and no. Okay, explain. Well, tell you the truth, Jordan, when I walked in a courtroom, even after going to court reporting school, I didn't know anything. You may as well have dropped me off on a street in China. And I mean, it was going so fast and furious. I didn't know what they were talking about. I was terrified. I was clearly over my head. But you know, they didn't give me anything, um, I don't want to say important, but they would never give you a murder trial when you're new. You have to wait, you know. They gave me civil stuff, and they gave me afternoon stuff that the papers had already been filed, and if they, if I messed it up, they had a paper trail. I mean, because there's two sides, they call it the sides of the court. They don't sit side by side, but there's a criminal side and there's a civil side, and you may know this already, but a civil, civil side is like, you're in Roach Brothers and you slipped on a grape, you know? <laughs> or you worked at a, um, that happens all the time, and you know what? You kind of, it's very, let's put it this way. On this, they have a, I shouldn't say this, but I will. They, they have a saying, only the dogs go to trial. Meaning, if the case was worth its salt, it probably would have settled out of court. And I can just say one, I'm going to say this, because this is a quote from numerous judges I've worked with. They say, if you are on a, in a civil dispute, and if you are offered something prior to trial, take it because statistically what you're going to recover from a jury almost never mm. is higher than now interesting also this is one thing i've never talked about jordan they have a thing on the civil side i've seen it it's not all the time but they have a thing called a high low so say jordan slipped on the grape and he they offered him twenty thousand dollars and jordan's like no i think it's worth eighty thousand and the lawyers can make a, the jury doesn't know this, but the lawyers can make a deal prior to picking the jury. They have what's called a high-low. And they'll say, if the jury comes back and gives Jordan 5,000, our high-low will be 10,000 and 90,000. So if the, I don't know if I'm making sense, but in other words, when the jury comes in and it's lower than what Jordan wanted, they'll give them the cap, like they cap it. I don't, am I oh, making so sense? They, they could get like the so lowest. there's a minimum that he's going to yeah. Get. yeah, so he's not going to lose his shirt. So he knows he's going to get at least this, and it's not going to exceed that. Because, you know, sometimes you can get blindsided. You can ask, you can say I was a lawyer and I offered you 30000 because you slipped on the grape and you hurt mm -hmm. your back. Yep. One, I've seen this. Juries will come back and give like $1.2 million. And everyone's like, <gasps> and then like, you know what? You almost have to get the paddles out for the insurance adjuster sitting on the back of the, you don't know who he is, but I know there's always an insurance adjuster sitting there. And they almost have to, they almost have to be resuscitated. But it doesn't happen all the time. But I've, see, I've seen everything. I'm on what, my 33rd year in court. I've seen, I've seen lawyers get so worked up when they're giving their pitch to the judge, they collapse. They have an anxiety attack. They have to go out to Mass General. On, like, oh, I'm telling you, the stuff I've seen. Well, let's do this uh, brief. I want to be brief on this because the, the court cases and the stuff that we talk about in the podcast is really the cool stuff. But in the courtroom, uh, there's more decorum than we see on TV. It, oh, you absolutely. Can't, you can't just get up, as Diana has just informed me, you can't just get up and wander over to the jury box and put your elbow there like Sam Waterston and start bloviating. And the judge, it, male or female, doesn't matter, is the supreme being in the, in the court, am I correct? Yeah. Okay, who are some of the other players that you work with? Well, okay, you have the judge, naturally, that's the one wearing the black dress, right? Right, the black so dress. So you have that with the bat wings. We've talked about the bat wings. Yes. Yeah. So, and then there's me sitting there, not saying a word, the person right underneath the judge is the clerk. And I mean, we've even had like jurors write on a piece of paper. What function is that person? Like, and it's like, that person does so much you can't even believe it. It doesn't, might not look it to you, but they are an integral part of, 
they have so many balls in the air, you have no idea. And they have an important job. Yeah. So you have them. The court officers are the ones that look like police officers. In Massachusetts, they're called court officers. In other states, they may call them bailiffs. They are unarmed. But that's, though they always have a, a thing here, uh, you know, what is it? Like. The walkie-talkie type. So even if their hands were impaired, they could go like this and ask for help. And I, I always tell this story. I worked there for years, and there was a problem once. It was during a recess, and I was up at the front where my desk is, and a couple of the people, there was a family dispute, and they had a ton of money. And you know what? I wouldn't know that, but you know, every family fights, but when it comes to money, and they had a lot of money, they were brothers, they were fighting. They got into a full-blown fist fight. They're all like 68 years old, punching each other out. <laughs> No, but I did. No, it was. Um, I'm not going to say their names because one of them was my neighbor. But it's a long story. And you know what? Every time I used to see him after that, he'd go, Are "You wearing a wire? You wearing a wire?" He used to say it to me every single. He's like, "Stand back! I think you're wearing a wire." Oh my god! Because I worked at the court, but I couldn't help but like him. But anyway, they got into a fight. These are men, like almost 70 years old. It looked. You know how you're a kid and you played pig pile. It looked like a picture. Yes. It looked like it in a um, cartoon when they have all the fur flying. Yeah. Well, the judge had walked out and she saw it and had to shut her door because if she had seen it, it would have tainted her because she was making a decision, a legal decision on what they were bringing forward. Yeah. And I got so scared, I ran out of the courtroom and I went to the next courtroom. And as luck would have it, that was room was empty except for one court officer. And I opened the door and I went, fight! And he came, within three seconds, there were like eight court officers. But by that time, the brothers were all standing up. Their, their shirts were out, and I mean, you know, they were all red-faced. And, and the court officers were like, what happened? And like, nothing, nothing, and they, they're fixing themselves. Well, one court officer walked up to me and he said, why didn't you hit the panic button? I said, what? Who There's knew? I worked button. there 20 years, never knew there was a panic <laughs> button in each court. It's underneath with a clerk. Um, and I'm like, I could have just gone like where I sat, I could have gone like that. Oh my God. And anyway, my big mouth running in the other room was suffice. That was my panic button. But I looked at him and he's like, I said, what panic? He says, come here. I'm like, what? He showed me, he goes, don't you know that? I said, I didn't get the memo, I don't know. And I found out that there was a panic button in every room. You've often told me, on the air we talked about this, the fact that you feel very safe, however. These are very Absolutely. skilled. Most of them are vets, very tough and very skilled, and they know how to squash something. Oh yeah, I've cool. never felt unsafe. These court officers are so well-trained and so professional. Some of them are just, not just, I don't mean it like that, but some aren't, but a lot of them have seen time in Afghanistan, on the Iraq, a little courtroom in Suffolk County with like two brothers punch, it's, it, it pales in comparison to, but you know, in Boston we have a lot of gang activity and a lot of gang situations in the courtroom and they handle it like champs. Yeah. Oh because my God, the, even the are, women, the women court officers are terrific. These are the people who come and sit in the gallery, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I just had, I'm not going to say it, but it was a couple of years, right before COVID I did, oh, it was an awful. You know what, the older I get, I look at 19-year-old kids and I'm like, have a li life's too short. Wait till like your shoulder starts killing you every night. You know what I mean? You're yeah. young. What are you so angry about? Get a pizza, have a joke, you know, go chase a, a girl and like go bring her out for, you know, have a nice pizza and have a good night. They're all so angry. What are they angry about? They're young, they're healthy, and they're shooting each other. Yeah, you dissed me. What is that? <laughs> Everyone gets dissed every day, for God's sake. Who doesn't get dissed all the time? Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's do this. Let's talk about some cases because the podcast has evolved really nicely, and I do these for a living, so I know how the arc runs. And we started out, uh, just Diana and myself talking, I, me asking questions. And the first, one of the first podcasts uh, had to do with uh, a murder case that went under the radar. We'll talk about some of the famous cases that we talk about. The old lady that lived oh, uh, I know. across the Hilda way. Hilda DiVincenzo. And this is exactly the kind of thing that happens, sadly, all the time. We want to just recap that? Yeah, you know what, what a big, a big like, thing to me when I started working there? I had no idea how many people murder people. 
I thought it was like rare. But there's so many of them that don't make channel four, five, and seven that, you know, there might be this big a blurb. Yeah. I'm going to work like on the blue line going, oh, there it is. Like, or there'll be like two people. It's so sad. Like someone got killed and there's like three people in the back. And it's like, wow. There's nobody there for that. But I do digress. What did you ask me? Uh, the, the first oh, one Hilda. We did. This yeah. was the lovely woman. She was 80-ish years old. She lived in a triple decker, which she owned, and she lived on the Revere Everett line. And if, for a point of reference, you may know there's a famous place to eat across the street, Newbridge Cafe. If you haven't gone there, go. It's stuck in a time warp from the 70s, but in a good way. Perfect for us. Like, you know, it's got yeah. like Bobby Orr with like wood paneling and Bobby Orr on that. But they, they have, they're known for their steak chips and their lamb chips, and they make their own salad dressing. They used to make their own ginger ale. I don't know. It's just a cool place. It's not fancy, and it has the best salad. Oh, it's so good. But anyway, um, and they have the best cold beer on draft. It's awesome. But anyway, right across the street is a triple decker, and she owned it. And for years, she lived with her husband on the middle one, and the other two were vacant. She had like a, a niece or something in college and lived in the first one. Anyway, she decided that she was going to put on, what was it, Craigslist. Oh, she, yes. was, she was going to rent the, the bottom and the top. And she, what a nice lady she was. She was so innocent. She, you know, the old-fashioned way, you know what I mean? She vetted the people herself. She rented to people here, and she rented to people on the third floor, and within a week, she was murdered in her apartment by the guy that she rented the top. He came with his girlfriend and her adult son, and the guy on the first floor was in, it happened in the daytime, and he was a junkie. It was all drugs. And she was just so innocent and so trusting. And, and the, the remarkable thing, and we talk about this on the podcast, is how stupid, thank God, criminals are in oh, this yeah. case. Unbelievable how this case unravels. No scholars, so okay? <laughs> you want to just tell a brief story, then we'll, we'll talk about some other cases. What he did was, in the end, first of all, we did the trial and it was a hung jury. And then a little while later, not much long, longer, we had a, picked a whole new jury and he was convicted. But he left her in the apartment and then I guess his... Who, who did the murder? The guy on the bottom? No, the guy on the first floor heard it. But he never called the police because he was illegal. Uh, and he was afraid to be deported. He went in his car and he played Candy Crush and called his girlfriend. He was the nicest guy. He really was. He was trying to do the right thing. He worked. Even though he was illegal, he, he was awesome. He was terrified. But the guy on the third floor, after he killed her, he stole like some jewelry from her and the rent money back. And he went to Golden Oldies on Route 16 in Everett. Which is a pawn shop. And he used his own name. And he pawned the stuff. <laughs> Jesus. And then when they got the search warrant and went in, he, they lifted up his mattress and her wedding ring was underneath it. And he said he found it in the yard in a trash bag. Not a very good liar. Yeah. And you know what else he did the, to boot? Here's the best. He it was right around the 4th of July. It was an unbelievable heat wave. He killed her and she was there for a few days on the ground, like on the floor. And then his, I guess his conscience got the best of him and he wanted her to get found. So in his infinite wisdom, he set the house on fire. Oh. He went into the cellar. He couldn't even do that right. He was the loser, I'm telling you. But we went down the cellar because they bring all of us to the scene of the murder. In a bus sometimes, right? It looks like the bus that goes to Foxwoods. That's all I can explain, <laughs> the big bus. You know what, I got on for a view. You know the big buses that go to Fox? They bring like all the Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a big yeah. thing. It's a. Equipment? Oh, yeah. I'm like a fool running. You wouldn't believe. No one even cares. I'm like, wait a second. It's so awkward. Yeah, no, it's, it's really weird, right? Because the jury, in some cases, right, the jury will go, the judge, the prosecutor, the attorney, you, court officers, I'm sure. It's, it's well, we're, this is what happens. They, oh, first of all, when they go, 
the purpose is to get the jury to be able to see the scene. Yeah, that, that I, makes sense. I didn't realize like the court employee was interesting. Yeah. But, the, but technically, th there's never any testimony. It's just the right. DA does most of the talk and he'll say, okay, I want you to stand underneath this light pole and look up here at this window. Like, that's what they'll do. And I'm like a fool. And I say to the DA, would you wait for me, please? Or they'll talk on the bus with no warning. And they're, 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 they're like back us to me. And the bus is going, Aah! and I'm trying to get it. I'm like, hello, excuse me. you know. But I have been on them carrying my machine over snow banks. I've done it in sleet, snow, heat waves. Unbelievable. Uh, one house we went in, there was a murder in Alston. It was young kids. It was like testosterone. It was New Year's Eve. One was trying to get to bed because he had to work at Staples the next day. And he said, shut up. And the girlfriend said this. And everyone was drinking. And they, uh, so there was, he, it was, but we went into the house where this all happened. They were playing a drinking game in the cellar. And um, we went into the house. And there was like this huge snake, like a ball python. Oh, and it was just like there to greet us at the door. And I'm like, oh, my god. I'm just like, woohoo. Well, uh, getting back to, we're going to move on quickly because Sorry. there's, no, no, that's okay. Digress, do we? I know. Uh, I'm just remembering all great. this. A story, she's a storyteller. How, how could you ever forget that? When you, you can't. When you you walk in, there's a the big middle. snake. There are so many things that happen in, in trials and courtrooms and so forth. Um, but I want to talk about some of the other cases that you either worked on directly or knew of directly because you worked there. The one you worked on that everyone might remember, that most people will remember, is the Grenadier case. This was the allergist who lived in Wellesley who ended up being convicted of murdering his wife in a brutal murder uh, while they were out walking the dog. On Halloween. Now, just to refresh your memory, Jordan, I didn't work on it. I was in the building. Oh, but okay. I did not work on it. Okay, I was we'll walking. You're thinking of yep, Cater. We'll get to that. But I was walking through the, you know, and saw all the players. But we had a, a guest who yep. was there, the court officer who attended. Bill. To, right. So talk from Quincy. He's from Quincy. Talk a little bit about that case and what he told us about this guy, Grenadier. Oh, yeah. You should, if you get on the podcast, you should listen to it. We had a guy that was, a, he had been a... I think a journalist for the Herald, and yeah. he wrote a book about it. And we had him come on with the court officer who took was in the you know charge of Grenadier, and um, he told us the court officer told us that Grenadier was cold as ice. He called him Teutonic, like Germanic, mm -hmm. just you know cold as ice. But his children were there throughout the whole trial, and they from what I understand, still believe in his innocence. That happens a lot, though, I think. when w There are many uh, documentaries I've seen where the children you know, really want to defend their parents. How can they want to believe that the father killed the mother? But this was a case in which there's so much hard evidence. It was pretty hard not to convict him, I would think. What did he say happened if he didn't? Somebody else, in the, he found his wife in the woods. Um, you know what foiled his whole thing? If you remember this, Jordan, so when he came out of the woods after killing her, there was like a guy, a young gentleman, he, like in his 30s, standing there with his dog watching the whole thing going, this is odd. You know, like he, he got bagged by this kid. But, but the thing that really impressed me with our interview was the, the look and the icy cold sort of demeanor of this guy who was a respected allergist, people all over the place. All were. over the world he was known for his, yeah. yeah. And, and every once in a while, we talk about the teenager gang types, but every once in a while there's a case like that and you go, wow, that's the guy next door. That's the respected neighbor. That was a while. But the one that he, did work Cater. is the famous Mary... Mary Lou Arruda. Mary Lou Arruda 1978, case. the murder happened. James, let me just set it up. James Cater was tried several times. This was a vicious killer, yeah. tried several times. <clears throat> and uh, he just passed away, thank God, a few years ago. In what prison. an awful man. All right, tell the story a little bit from your vantage point. Yeah, well, I got in it in the 90s, when it, like K to 4. It had already been gone through the system three times. And they retried it way up in Cambridge. It was in Cambridge Court, Middlesex County, to change the venue, you know, to give him a level playing field 
And he, at one point, I have to tell you this part, in one, I told Jordan, I couldn't help, you know how you're not supposed to do something, but you just can't help yourself? I'm human. At one point, I looked at him, and I went like this, and he went like this to me. Yeah, he gave you the... I was just like, woo, all righty then. You know, he's probably thinking, okay, how can I dismember this one? But you know what, he, he, he was an evil man. He had, how do I, he went down, he was getting, he had been in prison for doing a similar thing. He got out of prison, I think he served six or seven years. He was being outpatient treated at the Bridgewater. State Hospital. Yeah. And now down where Bridgewater is, he ended up going down Route 24 into Rainham, Mass. And gets his eye on this poor kid coming. She took the, she came home on the school bus, gave her brother the books and said, Tell Mara I'm going down to Josie's house to get my bicycle. She left her 10 speed there the night before. This is the first week of school. She was about 15 or 16. Unfortunately for her, coming home, this is a small, beautiful little town, Raynham. She's coming home, and there was like a little patch of the road which was secluded. And who was there but James Cater? And he abducted her. So the sad thing is, now, just me, not that I have a criminal mind, but if I was going to kill someone, would I be in a screaming green, like the most unbelievably bright car, the most distinctive looking vehicle you can imagine he's in. It has a distinctive racing stripe on the side. But he threw her, I don't know if he threw her in the trunk or the, the front, but the mother was at the front window and recalls that car going by. Her daughter was in it. Mm. it but the... She, so she went to get her bicycle, talked to her friend Josie, and she said, I'll see you later at cheerleading practice. And you know, they were all so innocent. The brother, who was the paper boy, he ended, they were all eating popsicles. And they found her popsicle stick, not a popsicle, or her lo lollipop stick where she was abducted next to her bike. So I mean, they were just kids. And he came along, the brother of Josie, and he found Mary Lou's bike laying on the side of the road. And he's like, what the heck? And he called her name out. He, you know, he got on the stand and said, I called her. She never responded. So I picked her bike up. And when on my paper route, I put her bike against the side of the house and just you know, kept going. So then they realized she's missing. Well, make it fast forward. They found her 20 miles away in Freetown State Forest. If that happened the first week in September, right around Halloween, two kids were like on dirt bikes. They almost didn't even stop. They thought it was a Halloween prank. Mm. It was her tied to the tree. And he had tied her so tight, her, he had, she was decapitated. But you know what was weird? I do, do remember, they brought the whole tree in the courtroom. 25 years later, they had the tree with all the blood on it. But we went down and saw his car. They brought his car to the courthouse. but. He had taken her personal effects when he left her on the tree and put them in a semicircle in front of her, like placed them, her pocketbook and her this and her that. Just like, why? Just, but here's the part I think that finally put this whole thing to bed. For the, on, now we're on K to four. This is the fourth trial. For the first time, the Commonwealth of Mass put on a witness she had been a former, she lived in, she was, grew up, I think, in Andover, Mass. Years before the Mary Lou Arruda abduction and murder, James Cater was up in, I believe, Boxford, Mass. Same thing, textbook. Middle of the afternoon, gets his eye on the girl, about 15 or 16, with a bike, abducts her. But this girl lived to tell about it, and she came and testified. And I'll tell you, it was, I was like riveted. I'm like, wow. She now is married with children and lives, I think, in Virginia-ish, somewhere in the Mid-Atlantic states. And the funny thing is, they said, are you traumatized from this? Are you, you know, how is your life now? She said, absolutely not. She was the toughest thing. I loved it. I was like, yes. Well, tell the story about how she escaped or oh, survived. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to. She told us, she got on the stand, and I'm telling you, everyone was just their jaws. 
she got on, the, she was beautiful. She had a big thing of blonde hair, and you know, she was married, she had kids, and they said, she said, yes, he stopped the car, was outside the car, just like Mary Lou Arruda. He like asked for directions or something. So she kind of stepped forward to say, go this way. Hand over the mouth, puts her in the car, drives her to, into the woods, and marches her, and, you know, they exit the vehicle, now they're in the woods. He takes a tire iron, boom, splits her head open, back of her head. Brings her further into the woods to like a stream. Was there sexual assault? Or he tried but wasn't capable of it, she testified. And with Mary Lou Arruda, there was no, he didn't rape her. So they surmised he tried to but was unable to in his... Methods. Just, yeah. So yeah. everything, it was like tech, it was like a mirror image of what they pieced together happened to Mary Lou. This girl is telling in real time what happened to her. So she marches her in the woods and he opens, you know, boom, with the tire iron, gets her deeper into the woods. He takes her head and tried to drown her. And she said, he had my, his hand on my head and I knew I was going to die. Her head was submerged. She was forward like this in this brook or stream or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. She said, the, oh, I knew I was going to die, so I had a fight. She said, I lifted up. She said, he's wearing glasses. She grabbed his glasses and threw them. And he, like, let go of his grip. She went crazy, like, crazily running away. He couldn't see a thing. He finally finds his glasses and catches up to her. Puts her in the car and puts her deeper in the woods. Ties her to the tree. She passes out unconscious and he thinks she's dead. She wasn't dead. She comes to. She wiggles herself out of her restraints on this tree. Can you imagine this happening? She doesn't know where she is. Her head was split open. Her eyes were bloodshot. All her clothes were like torn. She finally gets to the edge of the, somewhere, she finds a neighborhood and she goes into a yard. There's a woman on her hands and knees gardening, like putting petunias in. Oh. And she walks up to her, the lady was probably pinching herself going, am I dreaming? And you know, she's like, I need, that's how she was saved. Amazing. And that's, and that's what finally put him away. That witness really helped. For, yeah, but sick, he went to jail for like six years for that got out and then like less than a year later went after Mary Lou Arruda. Can you believe that whole thing? You know, it's crazy. that's just one example and uh, it, it's just mind blowing and yet it's a famous case in Massachusetts. We have had, Diane has had many guests including judges and attorneys and one of the attorneys, this is a great story to share with you, oh, yeah. is a famous uh, criminal attorney named Jay Carney. And you'll recognize him if you see him in the news or on the newspapers. Yeah. Very uh, white beard, balding, and very uh, very well respected. Nice uh, guy. He is a sweetheart of a guy, yeah. but he takes on the worst of the worst cases, such as before we talk about the. Case. Well, he had that. Remember in Sudbury, remember in Sudbury, Mass. That he was an American citizen, but he was an Al Qaeda sympathizer. Remember him? He had him. He defended him. Yep, he's in federal prison right now. Right. But he also, he's had all, all kinds of doozies. Uh, John Salvi. Yeah. Remember, the, the, remember in the 90s, the early 90s, when John Salvi went to two abortion clinics and shot them up in Brookline? Yeah. That's how we got metal detectors in Massachusetts Superior Courts, because of that case. Wow. They put it into Dedham Court, and then they, that's when we first got metal detectors, because of that case. So we're going to talk about a personality you all know yeah. in a second. But before we do that, you know, a lot of us believe that uh, there's not enough justice at times. But then again, the system is designed, as he explained so beautifully, that even the most heinous of criminals, you know, terrorists, deserve their place in court uh, because that's the system. If you start, sh you know, shearing off rights for some, they're coming after us next. It was a very interesting take. But the case we want to talk about briefly, and we talk about it on the podcast, is that of Whitey Bulger. Yeah, it was Bulger's lawyer. And but the funny, it. tell the funny part. You want me to tell it? Yeah, I love right. how you tell this. So this is hilarious. He's Whitey Bulger's lawyer when Whitey was captured. And Whitey was captured, and the FBI took all of his earnings, so to speak. So he was in, I guess, indigent, they would say. He had no money. 
So a court appointed an attorney, and there were a bunch of big name attorneys that showed up in the picking order, and he was the one that was selected. So he's meeting with Whitey Bulger, the most a serial killer, basically, and a very dangerous guy. <laughs> it's almost funny. He's but telling us the story. We would die in. So he's in a private room at the courthouse, in a you know, guarded by people around him, and he's in a closed room, and. He's looking at Whitey Bulger. He's sitting as far away as we are. Yeah. And he realizes Whitey looks exactly like him. Oh, yeah. Because Whitey was bald with the beard. You all remember the picture, right? And that's exactly what... And so in our studio, Jay holds up a picture of Whitey Bulger, that famous picture, and he puts his face there. And <laughs> son of a gun if it isn't the same face. And, and Jay Carney actually said he feared for a few moments that yeah. Whitey could bop him over the head put on his suit, take the briefcase, and walk oh, yeah. out of the courtroom. Oh, yeah. Would you put it past Whitey? I mean, come on. So anyway. Uh, it was hilarious. But, but a, a fascinating thing. And Diane, if you can recall, he talked about the letters that he would take. Oh, yeah. Do you want to tell that story briefly? Oh, you, you're good at that. Oh, I'm good at that. I'm just, I'm just an observer. He would take the letters from Whitey's girlfriend to Whitey. He was the go-between. Yeah. That, Whitey wasn't in contact with anybody except his attorney. But wow, I mean, just, yeah. and, and he even said, uh, I'll just end it with this, he even said, you know, he's, he knows, Jay knows that this is a guy who's probably killed, what, 15 people by, with his bare hands, let alone all the people he ordered killed. And it's a weird thing to be sitting that close to somebody, that infamous. You know, I can speak to that, like in court, there have been times, depending on the courthouse, the older courthouses aren't as, I don't want to say equip, but we have a lot more business in court now than we did 90 or 80 or 70 years ago. So the old courthouse is on as spacious, and you might be closer to a defendant than, you'd, than you would like to be. But I've had instances like they'll bring in a, somebody that has murdered someone and has been in jail for 30 years, and for some reason they have a motion and they're trying to get out of jail. They'll sit like this close, and there's dead time. There's a lot of dead time in court. You can't help it. No one's like you know, messing off, like no one, but there's certain protocols that have to be met. So a lot of time it's hurry up and wait. So yeah, I've been this close and murderers will start a conversation with me. And I have to tell you, they're delightful. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't be if they were like icing you, but. If you're talking about people who uh, committed murder 30 years ago, the chance of a recidivism in the federal rules is like 0. 0.003 percent. That's yeah. right. As, yes, the statistics show that. But you know, I think like, human beings, including my, in myself, we're all flawed and we're imperfect and we're made up of many different compartments and all of us have the capacity to love and be awesome, but people have mean streaks and people have bad days and it doesn't rise to the level of killing someone, but people are complicated and they can still and, be delightful but have killed someone third. I don't know how to describe and, it. And I think what, we've, what you've noticed, and it's nothing that it's pretty obvious, is alcohol and drugs is a huge oh, yeah. part of it. Right? Oh yeah, yep. I mean, mental and mental illness, which is, I don't I think, think it's half the well, that, I'm so glad she brought that up because yeah. our podcast that's about to hit in the next week or two, uh, and I'll have Diane explain, is with an attorney who's actually tried insanity cases, which yeah. is wild. And he got somebody hurt. off. He had PTSD from Vietnam. Yeah. But I mean, the, if you remember the Hinckley case who shot Ronald Reagan yeah. in 1981, um, he actually was found not guilty and for with reason of insanity, I believe. Yep. And he's now a free man under some restraint. But uh, yeah, so the Whitey Bulger thing was pretty interesting. We also uh, had someone on recently talk a little bit about the Innocence Project. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, there's one thing that really ticks me off is I we all can't. I not just me, but injustice. Anyone that didn't do something and they get convicted, it just it makes me just crazy. And another thing that I notice is when you watch the news at night, like me, someone will be arrested and you can see them going with handcuffs across the room. They're not guilty. I mean, I think like people say, oh, he got it, he did it. There are so many things that can go wrong and so many slants the people can really have trumped up charges. And believe me, I have the most respect for district attorneys. They work hard and they're, they're usually on point, you know, but 
there are mistakes that are made on many levels, and I think sometimes someone can open their mouth, he raped me. I mean, no. I mean, you can ruin someone's life. It makes me sick. So we, you know the Innocence Project, are you familiar? We had a kid, I call him a kid, how old is he, oh, Shorty? He's in his 40s now. He's in his 40s. He was on death row for how many years? Nine. 13 or four, nine, nine years? Or 10 years? In Florida, for something he didn't do. And it just makes me so sad. Did you cover Southern Superior the other day, Thomas? Yeah. But you know what is interesting? He wasn't the DA when that happened. When that was, he's on the case. A lot of them, because when you like, like Sean Ellis. No, he's not. Right. Mm -hmm. He was ADA under Sean, under Sean Ellis. Yeah, but we did a podcast specifically with the Sean Ellis attorney, and that's oh Rosemary case. Scappaccio. Yeah, she's yeah. wonderful. You guys know her. Yeah, you've seen know what cracks? Doc? You've seen the doc on Ness uh, Netflix. You know what's funny? I laugh so hard with Rosemary because I've been on a lot of cases with her, and you know what? She's court reporter friendly because her sister's one, but and she's also <laughs> just really nice. She's awesome. But the funny thing about her is we all, we don't laugh behind her back. We love her, but we talk like most lawyers. Like when it's the, you know they'll say you know, I pa like. In Massachusetts, they don't say it a lot. I pass the witness. You always know it's an out-of-state lawyer when he'll say, I pass the witness. It's a Southern thing. But they'll say, no more questions, Your Honor. Ready for cross-examination? Rosemary Scappaccio will stand up. Like, usually they gently go over to the podium and they'll say, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Scappaccio, and I have a few questions for you. I represent Mr. Blah, blah, blah. This is Rosemary. She does it on the kitten heels. She gets up, you know those little kitten heels? It's a chick thing, you wouldn't know. But anyway, she gets up, and she has papers in her hands, and she goes, so that's what you said yesterday, huh? And all of a sudden, everyone in the courtroom goes, like, we're ready for it. Cause we, and she's going, really, huh? And she'll slam, it's hilarious. Like, she gets your attention. She won't even say who she is or why she's there. She goes for the juggler, yeah. right? But you know what? She's effective. And she's quick. She gets to the point, and she gets out. And she's she's an unbelievable lawyer, and she's nice. She's nice. Here's a question that always comes up, and it must be hundreds of times you've seen a judge go. Oh, the gavel. I've never seen a judge do it. I feel like I get ripped off. Um, we had one judge that retired, and he must have had like a son that was in woodwork shop or something. Made him like a. It's this big. Remember like Bam Bam? Remember yes. The so he always carried it from courtroom to courtroom, wherever he worked, the judge, and he'd keep it in front of him. It was very cool. But I have never seen a judge go, you know, case that's dismissed. Just a percentage of your stuff is actually in court, because you're doing depositions and all that stuff. I've done a ton of them. Well, when I was a state worker, I was in court five days days a week for, oh God, well over two decades. Wow. Like five days a week in a courtroom. So would, but would you do the depositions on the same case and keep it? Uh, no, um, on, the on the criminal side, there very seldom are depositions. Uh, on, the on the civil side, I, di I didn't do the depositions. Like I, I did depositions all through the pandemic on Zoom because the courts were closed for trials. I only ask, I wonder where are you pulling, like, so you got all, like, where are you pulling materials for the podcast? Oh. That's it. You know, if I can answer that, yeah. um, because I, I think it'd be kind of interesting if, if well, I'd love to put it this way. It's more interesting the way Diane has laid it out and I've helped her in that we've attracted journalists who have written about certain cases, like the yeah. Charles Stewart case. Joe yep. Sharkey is a gentleman who's fabulous. And uh, we just had him on again. He'll be on again talking about uh, the case that was called Above Suspicion with yeah. the FBI agent. Uh, getting involved with a murder. And I think your question is a good one. A lot of the stuff we've talked about is you'll bring in the transcripts to remind yourself yeah, yeah. of Does exactly. Access to that stuff? Well, it's my, yeah, yeah. I, I lived it. It's, it's considered yours. Yeah, much easier well, it's all public yes. record. It yeah. isn't mine. The only thing I'm saying is by virtue of the fact that I transcribed it and I have all the notes to it, 
you know, the original will get filed in the court and the lawyer will get a copy, you know, the, the, which the, the um, court will assemble, they call it assemble the record, it goes to the appellate court. But um, I have it all in my computer. You know what, I remember. Yeah, I remember. How do you forget this stuff? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Certain things jump out at me from even years ago, like. Well, one of the things that's interesting is, is how we become inured to this kind of stuff or almost become blasé about it because you have to. You have to put up that front. I mean, police officers and even doctors, I mean, you, know, you see all kinds of horrible things. I, I, hospice workers, how do they do what they do? They're remarkable. But uh, is there humor behind the scenes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes for a bit of levity, like, funny things happen, you know? Funny things happen. We have a few laughs. But, um, yeah, and I'm on, the, on, the, on the civil side, it's not always, people will fight about crazy, like, crazy things. You know, the cases I've seen, like, but I've seen, like, um, I found out, I think I've learned so much more in court than I ever would, like, in college. Like, one day we had a um, jockey from Suffolk Downs who took a tumble off of a horse, so we found out all about what it's like to be a jockey. You know what I mean? You learn about all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Well, you had, when I'm talking sports, you had the big moment with the great one. Oh, Tom Brady, but I'm a little mad at him right now for not recognizing us, but that's whatever. Tom Brady comes in to testify in the Charlie Weiss medical malpractice case. Charlie Weiss was a coach, if you remember, who was heavy, had the uh, surgery to, you know, weight reduction surgery, and it didn't go well. So Tom shows up, and what happens to the courthouse when Tom shows up many years ago? This was in 2007, and it was Suffolk Superior Court, which is huge. It has 21 courtrooms. And I saw my coworkers, the men, they were grown men. They turned into like seven-year-old kids. It was unbelievable. You would have thought Jesus Christ landed at Suffolk <laughs> Superior. There was an entourage of, there was like a, like, you know like on the Peanuts comic strip, Pigpen has that dust bowl thing around him? That's what he had, only it was humans. It was, un I've, the only other time I've seen that much fuss over a human is I was in a place once where Jackie Kennedy Onassis was, and I've never seen, <clears throat> scrambling and da it was unbelievable. But this actually, equal Jackie Onassis. You actually got to be with him. I did, alone. What were the chances? Because yeah. he needed some place. Well, they decided it was getting so unruly and un it was crazy that they needed to house him in a separate quiet room until he was ready to testify. What were the chances? They put him in the room next to me, which was unoccupied. But if you saw where my office was at the time, it had a side door. You know, like if you rent a hotel room and you see that weird door and you're like, what's that? It was like that. And I knew he was on the other side and everything got quiet and I'm by myself and I'm thinking, should I open it? What was I going to say? Are you Tom? I couldn't. Do you know what? I never got an autograph. I, did, I was too nervous to ask him. But I did go in the other room and the door opened and he was leaning against a desk like this. He had a suit on, but his... He had, like that. See, this is normal now, but I hadn't seen that. It was 2007. I never saw, like, an open. And he was leaning like this, and I said, hi. He couldn't have been any more gracious, kind, nice. And he asked me what I did, and he genuinely wanted to know. I told him all about court reporting, and uh, I asked him if he wanted, I don't know, so lame. Do you want some water or something? How do you know what to say? <laughs> and then... Um, <laughs> He, all of a sudden, I'm not going to name his name, but it was a court clerk from upstairs, came downstairs, so out of his element, he came to a civil floor, he wouldn't be caught dead down there, it's the only time I ever saw him down there, and he, he knew how to, he came through the side, he knew, somehow he knew, and he says, Tom, will you sign, he had something, I don't know what, will you sign this, and I was just like, oh dear God, and that was like the end of it, they took him away, but you know what, he, he struck me as kind of shy, and I'm not kidding you, he was a tad shy. He just reminded me of like someone like on Sunday, my brother would bring in the house, they were going up to the stadium to watch a game. Just a regular guy. It was just, just a, it was great. Your brush with greatness. That was it, it Is lasted. The laptop and the special keys? Like, is that what? Do you, you write, is that like special key, keyboard? Or is that a steno machine is. is. And, um, what's your travel setup? Oh. Oh, um, well, 
No, because I, when I have done steno, I do steno and I do voice writing, and most old, older court reporters like myself do voice writing. So you're voice writing? Yes, because when you're young you can do this, but people get all kinds oh, yeah. of bad stuff goes on. Now here's the funny thing. Go to the decibel level you're doing, what? During the session, the decibel level that you're speaking at, I'm just curious. You have to be pretty quiet, right? Yeah, and I have a loud voice, but I have a, I have like a, um, I have what's called a silencer. Really? Oh. Yeah, you can buy it and you stick it on there. I could use that because I'm so freaking loud. People know what I'm going to order in a restaurant over on the other side, but more about that later. You have such a soothing voice, though. Everyone loves your voice. Thank you very much. Do you know everyone that knows me, they'll go, you know that Jordan that you do that podcast with? I love his voice. I'm just here to attract the ladies. <laughs> That's all. Uh, are there any... Uh, any questions? I mean, the, you four guys and gals are here, so uh, what do you do, sir? Are you a journalist? Is that right? For, you, would you mind? I run a, something called, I, I own the, the Dig, Dig Boston. The, oh, the my Boston. goodness. I'm very familiar with Dig Boston. Uh, uh, Mark, I, Mark Hurwitz is yeah. a friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, really? Mark's our food writer. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I'm not, I was just here as a fan because I live nearby, but uh, I've, I've covered trials. I, I can't stand the judges, so I stay out of court. <laughs> Once for what? Reading in court. The students stop reading. So both oh both my God. Two hours for trials. So. Oh, I know. That is yeah. forbidden. Yeah. yeah. That is forbidden to read in a courtroom. No, you, I, but, but. I used to work for the Boston Phoenix. You, oh, the Phoenix. God, wow. Oh, Judge um, Lopez. No, I, it wasn't her court, but yeah. So yeah, her, her husband. Yes. Yeah, he's passed. Uh, she used to come in with the um, all the bracelets. Oh, yeah. Clinking. You, you worked in the courtroom with the Judge Lopez? Long time ago. And she had. She had the platform boots. The, the what are some other characters? I was also going to ask what, are, what some of the, what was like, you know, Tom Brady, but how about for trials? What are trials that have had swarms of people and reporters that, that really? Well, happened? when we had Hernandez, that was. Oh, you, you, you did? You, I didn't do it. I, trans, I transcribed about an hour worth of that because the person that was on it called me up and she's like, I need a little help. Can you give me a couple hours? So the next morning I walked in before proceedings began and, um, he kind of quizzically looked at me, and I looked at him, and I remember he had big hands. That's all I remember. Mm. And that was it. So it was quite... But, you know, in Boston, we don't get a lot of... Fit. Once in a while, like hardly ever, you'll see, like, you know, once we saw, like, Rod Stewart, I think, you know, on a... In, um, celebrities bring the crowd more than... More than yeah, well, you know, you know who was on jury duty once was um, Tom... Um, what's his name? Kerry. John, John Kerry. Kerry was on jury duty. Now that's interesting because you wonder how. Who's it here? Who's it here? Yeah. Who's on trial? Yeah, who it was, was on just, trial? No, it was just like a civil thing. And you know, everyone's like, he's on. So all the employees were going up to this courtroom. And you know how you have the little windows? They'd peer in like he was a farm animal. It's like, what, they, what are they looking at? So he was on it. And you know, we've had different people come through, but no one really. Um, Maybe a local celeb, but no one, you know, we'll get the anchor people, the news people. They have to do their, you know, they have to show up for jury duty. And we've never really had, I remember once the new kid on the block, I had a case with one of them. <laughs> it was a civil thing over a. Scandal? What? Oh, that was the. That, no, that's federal. That's federal court, yeah. Uh, Mowgli, Mowgli building, right? Mowgli We're the poor yeah. cousins. We're at yeah, the state. No, we didn't get that. No, we didn't get that at all. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you said how many murders you're working on? Like five? I had five this past fall. Three of them were guilty, and two are not guilty. Oh, I have that question. And this is, I'm, so I'm an amateur in this world. Like, that's one thing about Bono. Sometimes they're like, Park 38. Yeah. Are you there for 38? Like, a, a, a pretty sophisticated or a, a, a kind of wild murder case. How many actual times are you going to end up being? Oh, how many? How you mean per trial? Yeah. They're long. Yeah. They're like two and a half to three weeks. Well, you know what now? It takes three days to get a jury. I've been on mm -hmm. cases, murder cases, it takes five days to get a jury. Are you there for all of the jury selection? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely. The there are appellate issues that can come up left and right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a you know, what, <laughs> I, I guess we can mention this. The, the pay that Diane got in 1988 
Oh, for my transcript production. Not my salary, but my transcript production. Because the state, when, when you're on the civil, when you're in, in um, trouble with the law generally, usually indigent, I know I say that as a blanket statement, but most of the defendants are indigent. So for their appeal, they don't have any money to order a transcript from me, so the state pays for it. The state will order it. In 1988, I went to court in 1991. The last pay raise was 1988. So there's never been a nickel more that we've gotten to do these transcripts since I've been there. And, and the other thing that people don't realize is if you had a couple of extra swigs of Duncan regular on the way in. And oh, yeah. You can't, go to the bathroom. you can't leave until the recess, right? Well, you start at 9, and you have to wait till 11 or 11 15. You have to go to the bed at not, you have to go to the bathroom at 9 30, and you look and you go, oh my God, an hour and 45 minutes. But you know what happens when they call the morning recess? The jury trots out. Some judges will be like, counsel, do you want to discuss anything? <laughs> Here's my leg. I gotta oh, get out geez. of here. They gotta shut up. Yes. Honest to God. And you know, I think judges forget that some of them, they can walk from here to that door and they're in their private lobby with a private bathroom. We have to stand in line in some court. It takes the whole the break is never refreshing and it's never you don't regroup. You just have to you have to like call your mother or you know, like something's ha or a lot of times, like someone's looking for a transcript, so they know there's going to be a break at 11, and you see them come in the back of the courtroom and they're waiting for you. So when you finally break, naturally they come forward and they're like, I need this transcript. It takes the whole break to order the transcript. I don't even get to go to the bathroom. Like, you know, like, and then you're back on the record till 1. There's so many things that have to be taken care of outside of those hours where we're in the actual trial. So many things. Yeah, and uh, just a final point, and please, any questions at all. Um, there's one story that, that always touches me when we tell it, um, and it's one of the few times you were thanked for oh, the yeah. work you did. You oh, want yeah. to share that as a captain? Oh, yeah, and I know people don't mean this, but because we don't have a, a I don't want to say pivotal, but we have a role, we're just, everyone forgets about us. Like they, they wouldn't, like when, like for instance, in the middle of testimony, they'll hand out DNA charts <clears throat> to everybody except for me. Why? Like I'm the one that's gonna sit in six months from now in a room by myself figuring out this, like what they say, allele, you know? And oh, I yeah. showed him, they're complicated. So um, they forget about you. At the end of the trial, they'll stand up. Yeah, like if they give it to make everyone's life easier, why do they go over my head and don't give it to me? The court gets one, the clerk gets one, everyone, the court off, everyone gets one but me. It's, it's like, like the what? panic button yeah, story. You're the only person the judge is nice to, and, and the bailiff, from in my experience. The clerk gets it, everybody is treated like a piece of shit. But I don't, the court reporter and the, and, and oh, I don't think I got extraordinarily treated nicely. No, no, they're not nice to you. <laughs> Some. You know what it's like? Yeah. Think about back in high school. You had um, the nice guy, the sweet guy, the bully. It's the same with judges. We have some that are lovely. We have petulant ones. You know what? I'm going to say this. I still take, I have to say it. S some of the best people I know and the worst people I know are judges. Like as far as like their personalities, are they all qualified? Yes. But some of them are mad at the world and I'm going, Six weeks vacation, you get treated like a god. Yeah. Ninth, 8.30 to 4.30 with like 11 holidays, six weeks vacation, what are you mad about? A free parking space in Boston. And you're mad? You know, it's like, what? They get Have you ever worked in a court like Russ Roxbury where, it, uh, you, where you, like a civil case followed by a criminal case followed by a civil case? Like, are you in the same, same court? I've done some district court, but not many. You know what I've done? I've done um, divorces. Those are scarier to me sometimes. I'm not kidding than murders. The, the, the tension is so high when it's over custody of children and money and love gone wrong. Mm. Wow. I don't know how anyone figures it out. Because you know what? I listen to the, the guy and I'm like, like, at first you listen to the wife and you're like, he's a jerk. And then you listen to the other side and you go, I think she's a you know, little 
tapioca. But you know what? I don't think they're lying. They see it that way. Right. From listening to it so many times, I'm like, that's the way this man saw it. And that's the way that wife lived it. And I don't know how a judge figures it out. I, I can't, it's above me. I don't know. Uh, the wisdom of Solomon, cut the baby. Yeah, really. And um, we've gone a little over, but yeah, is we there, have. I, I hope, I hope it, the people look, watching at home uh, will check out the podcast and uh, maybe subscribe because it's a lot of fun. And, uh, and we oh, have, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh. I didn't tell the. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I, no, uh, but I went off on a tangent. Okay. I know what you want me to tell the guy at the elevator. Just to tell this story to wrap it up. That, that this is this is this tells you a lot about human nature and also about the the tragic uh, tragedy of life. That's weird. But one time we finished a case, and the guy got sentenced, and it was over. So everyone stands up and everyone's milling around and I just take my stuff and go out the door and I go over to the elevator to hit the, to go up to my office. And this man, as I'm waiting for, the, first of all, Suffolk Superior, pack a lunch when you're waiting for an elevator. It takes forever. So I'm waiting and this man walks up to me with a young gentleman and he put his hand out and he said, I want to thank you. And I'm like, and I'm like, for what? He said, for working on my son's case. His son had been murdered. And I said, oh, okay. So I'm like, thank you. You know, I couldn't believe it. And then he said, I want you to meet my son such and so and shook his hand. This is all pre-COVID, so he shook. Mm -hmm. And then he said, um, I only have this son left. He said, not only was my son murdered, I lost another son to gun violence a few years ago. And I was like, wow. Now his son that got murdered on the case that I worked on, a case of mistaken identity broad daylight, it was in the area near Northeastern University, behind yeah. Northeastern. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, will you kill so-and-so for 10 grand? Okay. The problem is, when the poor kid got out of the car, he was perceived as the other person, and it was a mistake. Did you do an episode about that one? Yeah. We no, I didn't do an episode on that one. <coughs> Did I? No, we've talked about that one, yeah. You forget. I'm there at every podcast. Oh, no, I haven't done a full-blown one on that one. All right, that, you know what was chilling about that one? You know how today, no matter what, someone's, there's a camera on you everywhere now. Honest to God. Yeah. There's a, if you want to like kiss like your boyfriend behind like Costco, don't do it if you don't want it on film. Because <laughs> it was just like, it's unbelievable. You know what the Boston police do? And, they, and the, D, the DA do, does it, a section of the DA, and I think it's tremendous. They, it takes a lot of manpower. If there's like a murder, they'll go knocking on the door. Do you have any film? They'll piece together a whole thing from like 20 cameras. They show that on TV when you're watching. Yeah, the FBI. Sure. It's great. <laughs> Surveillance, yeah. yeah. But, That's how we got the Zarnaya brothers in the uh, it takes a yeah. lot of time but this guy that killed this kid by mistake they had him a few minutes after the murder in front of northeastern and all the kids you know they have their backpack he like was in the middle of him just standing there and i'm thinking he just shot someone to death like five minutes ago and these kids are looking at him waiting for the light to change you don't know who you're standing next to like there he was on the sidewalk with all these college kids going to class crazy uh, we were, were officially going to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we're so glad. And you guys were terrific. And you, sir, I've read your paper. It's great. Dig Boston. Everyone should read it. And uh, It is great. And do listen to the podcast. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you both. Thank you. Nice Bye. to meet you. I can't believe I'm the guy who has a baby.